Hi, everyone. Let's, let's start. Uh, my name is Will Wakeling. I'm the Dean of Libraries here. I'm, I'm doing the formal welcoming of you all, so welcome. Um, you may know about this series that the library uh, runs called Meet the Author. It's a, it's a really interesting series. It gets things out of the classroom into the university community. Indeed, we often have guests from outside the university. It gives us a chance to reflect on some issues of significance intellectually, academically, culturally. I think this particular event covers several of those. We look forward to, to hearing from John Powers, our guest today. We've, we've had a number of really good uh, uh, events in this program this year. This is the penultimate one of the Q Meets the Author series. We have one more next week, which I'll just give you a quick preview of. It's next Tuesday, April the 17th, and we have author and activist Paul Tukey coming. He'll present his book, Tag, Toss, and Run, a collection of classic and not so well-known lawn games. Capture the flag, fudge, all that sort of stuff, okay? But here's the kicker. We'll have his, uh, his, his presentation on his book, and then we'll all be adjourning over to the Centennial Common to play lawn games. So you get to get some exercise thrown in with the intellectual activity as well. So watch, watch the library's website if you want to find out more about these programs. And we're recording this presentation today, so you'll be able to refer your friends who aren't here to the library's YouTube channel to see a recording of uh, what they've missed. Uh, today's talk's brought to us with the help of our uh, co-sponsors. Big thank, thank you as usual to NU Bookstore. Copies of the book available outside. The author will be only too happy to sign them, I'm sure. Um, if you want to learn more about supporting this event and these events in the library, there's the library website or, or material at the desk at the front that you can fill in. So, Welcome, as I say, this is going to be really good. I'm going to ask our good colleague from, journal from the School of Journalism, Chuck Fountain, to do a few introductions. Uh, thank you, and let me add my welcome. I was uh, telling John that you know, he'll get a measure of my influence over my students. I've been selling this in my classes all week. Uh, I have two classes with a total of about 80 students, and as I look around the room, I can see that all but 80 of them have come. <laughs> uh, so, um, perhaps if I'd had a writing class this semester, I could have been more persuasive. Because I tell all of my writing classes that good writing is having something to say and saying it well. And there is nobody, I think, who embodies that more eloquently than John Powers that he has a mind like a steel trap, that whatever has entered into his mind over his lifetime is still there. And he has it at instant recall, that he can tell you stories and details of events that happened 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. And no one uses that information and uses the language uh, more gently, more respectfully, more elegantly, with more alarm than John Powers does. Uh, that uh, he has something to say, whether he's writing a book on Fenway Park or on one of the uh, other Boston sports teams that he's done throughout the years, or whether he's writing on the Olympic Games, or whether he's writing anything else that you see in the pages of the Boston Globe. And he's been all over the Boston Globe in his time there. But he keeps coming back to the sports department. He keeps going in and out the various departments and coming back to the sports department. And those of us that read the sports page uh, are very grateful for that, that he is one of the reasons that the Boston Globe is consistently rated as one of the best written papers in uh, the country. He came to the Boston Globe when Fenway Park was quite young, uh, that it was a mere lad of 60 when he first came to the Boston Globe. He is part of that extraordinary generation of Globe writers that came when Tom Winship was there. And what Tom Winship looked for in a new hire was someone with that capacity to use the language as John did here. Fitting that the Boston Globe should be publishing a book on the 100th anniversary of Fenway Park because the Boston Globe was there at the beginning of Fenway Park. That Fenway Park was built by the then owner of the Boston Red Sox, John I. Taylor, who was a scion of the Taylor family that owned and ran the Globe with such distinction for 
uh, more than 100 years. Any one of us who has crossed the threshold of Fenway Park has memories of Fenway Park, but no one is better at having gathered those memories or having been able to put them to voice than John Powers, and it is my pleasure to welcome him to Northeastern today. Thank you, Dean. Thanks, uh, Chuck. Actually, I think my, my mind can use a, a screen cleaning at this point. There's a lot of what I call brain lint in there, but it, it, uh, it did come in useful in this book, and I appreciate your, your being here. It's difficult to uh, uh, compete with exams and, more importantly, dinner sometimes. So <laughs> at least you, 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 you've gotten some snack here. Uh, let me just t talk a bit about uh, what we did, and, and uh, one of the things that we've become famous for under the New York Times uh, aegis, they like doing instant books, uh, wonderful championships one. We are now, I think, one for five on those. We had one on this year's Great Patriot Super Bowl history you may have heard about. Ready to go. Didn't happen. That is the second such Patriot. <laughs> we had one on the glorious victory over the Lakers. That didn't happen. <laughs> and these are books that are virtually 99% done because we, you do have to do them. We did one on the Bruins this year that did work, uh, which was probably might have been the least likely. And I got a call from Janice Page, who edited this book, or we're not, we're not edited, but was in charge of it, uh, the morning of the seventh game in Vancouver. And she said, can you write, if, the, if they win this thing, uh, can you write the forward for this? I said, sure. I said, when do you need it? She said, 6 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so literally, I was sitting in my, in my living room, and when I saw Chara hoist the cup, I said, all right, it's official. I think they won it. I opened my laptop, and it, it, it was the late at night. It was like a Wednesday night, and I banged on 400 words and sent it, and by Saturday morning, that book was on the shelves. And that's how quick they do these things. But if a puck goes the other way, all that's for naught. So the good thing about this book was we knew Fenway Park wasn't moving. <laughs> and remember, you may, you may have seen the old movie, uh, Butch and Sundance, right? And the, the idea is Butch likes robbing banks as opposed to trains. He says, they stay put, you know the money's in there. <laughs> so the good thing about this book was we knew Fenway would have the Congress this year and it would still be there. Now what's interesting is that, and again in recent history, uh, ten, 12 years ago, this, this park was supposed to be doomed. The previous ownership, the Harrington ownership, wanted a, a new ballpark. They felt as though this thing was on its last legs. They knew the Yankees would be eventually building a new place, they were afraid of losing the arms race, and so they basically had a campaign and said, this, you know, this thing is dangerous. They were taking uh, people on tour saying, see this thing leaking, and watch out for that, and that may buckle at any moment. So when the new owners buy, the, the Red Sox at what we thought at the time was a hugely inflated price, they haven't got the money to build a $650 million uh, ballpark, and you know, Boston won't spend the money. One thing about this town is we don't build uh, you know, uh, these sporting palaces for millionaires. Uh, Bob Kraft built his own place. Uh, Jerry Jacobs built, uh, built uh, his place. The Red Sox back in the day built theirs. So what we did do is we figured, all right, why don't we just, you know, renovate this place? Uh, so what you see now is pretty much a renovated but recognizable ballpark. One thing that's really about Fenway now, certainly when I, I saw my first game in 1956. And if I walked in then and saw this now, I said, you know what? How much has changed here? The same manual scoreboard is still there. It's still there. The wall's still there. Everything looks pretty much the same. And I'll, I, I would argue that a guy in 1912 who was there uh, probably said, you know what? I, I recognize this place. And I think one reason why it has kept our hearts all these years, in spite of the, the brutal grandstand. And as, as the ladies can tell you, the lack of a ladies' rooms, uh, we were told actually someone asked, is there a secret place or one of our last uh, signings that, that people don't know much about? I said, yeah, there's supposed to be an extra ladies' room someplace, but no one's ever found it. So. But I think one of the, the nice things about it is, is that it looks the same to me as it did to my grandfather, as it will to, to my grandchildren. And it's astounding when I talk to people around, I say, who took you to your first game at Fenway? 
astounding how many first it was a grandparent and not necessarily a grandfather it was a grandmother in many cases a parent a sibling and normally when you bring someone to the ballpark it is a child a nephew a niece so there is this continuity that goes for all these years as does a continuity of pain uh, if you look at our cover it says the coolest coolest ballpark and uh, looking through I mean going back 100 years and looking for all the wonderful highlights not many of them if you look at when they finally broke the curse that was in St. Louis they won the next World Series in Denver most of the great moments didn't happen here the one that did was when they won the 1967 pennant the great impossible dream where they were in ninth place the, you know the year before and that was the one moment and even then they didn't win it right then no one can celebrate in the ballpark because they had to wait for another game to be done. There was a double header being played, the Tigers and the Angels, and they had to wait to see how that was going to happen. So they had this mini celebration, right? They were drinking beer. There was no champagne yet because, as Dick Williams said, you know what? If that game doesn't turn out, the right, we are playing tomorrow. They would have had to play a playoff. So they were drinking beer and, you know, spearing each other with shaving cream. And then the owner, Tom Yawkey, went up to his office and sat it on waiting. Now, this game wasn't even on national TV, the one they were waiting for. The Sox were sitting in the clubhouse with a transistor radio, trying to get the station from Detroit. And finally, when they hit the, fi the, the final game, the final thing, double play, they all jumped up in the air, and they brought up the champagne. And the great story the lawn board tells in the book, uh, he said, you know, because uh, he won the game ball, he was the winning pitcher. He said, I'm going to give this ball to Mr. Yaki, because he had owned the club since 1930. Not many good things have happened to him. And he said, remember in the movie, The, the, the Natural, have you all seen that, with, with Robert Redford? Redford is a ball player, an aging ball player, and he goes up to finally meet the owner of the team that signed him years after he already was finished. And this owner likes to sit in the dark. He doesn't want to shine. And so Longbrook says, remember that scene? He says, well, I walked down, everyone's gone from the ballpark, the game's been over for a couple of hours. I walked down this narrow corridor, into his office and he's sitting there in the dark you know and he was as always drinking bourbon you know <laughs> he used to drown his sorrows a lot with that too and he handed him the ball and Yogi began to cry and that was the last fantastic moment that happened uh, I mean earlier they had blown um, the pennant in 1948 they had a playoff with the Indians and they lost had they won it they would have played the Boston Braves it would have been a trolley car series and then there was what we call the Bucky Bleeping Denton game, <laughs> where, where Bucky Denton hits a home run that was only a home run in Fenway with the wall. Any place else is an out. They lose a pennant playoff to the Yankees in 1978. And that's one of uh, someone, depends who you, uh, who you talk to, it may have been a Boston bartender. He said, they killed our grandfathers, and they killed our fathers, and now the sons of pitchers are coming for us. <laughs> <laughs> so there was always that feeling that terrible things were going to happen at Fenway. And one thing that was funny, when they finally won it in, in 2004, you may remember, they were down 3-0 to the Yankees in the championship series. And they were beaten that third game 19-8, and it was ugly. Uh, I was at Fenway, you can't believe it. They were booing, and I looked at it, they were littering, you know, throwing bottles in the outfield. Well, they come back, and they win game four on that miraculous Dave Roberts slide. And the fans were angry the next day. And the shock radio was, all right, here it comes again. They're going to suck us back in. <laughs> they're going to get us back. We've already buried them. We've already passed it. They're going to go back down to New York, just like last year. They're going to lose some stupid home run in you know, ninth inning. And then, no, no, not this time, not this time. So when they finally did it, and they won the pennant in New York, and they swept the Cardinals, and we were out of St. Louis. And it was, it was a sweep. It was a four-inning four sweep. And it was an easy game, we thought. And the final out, you may remember, a little tapper back to the mound, and Keith Bouquet is running over to first base, and who's going to throw it under there? And all the Boston sports writers in the press box are screaming, no, 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 no. <laughs> Everyone thought it would go over his head, <laughs> the Cardinals will win that game, win the next three, and it would be over. <laughs> so instead, it's over, and we're all saying, that's it, that's it. <laughs> there's no pain, there's no hellish thing we have to go through here, that's all we have to do here. And so we had probably a couple thousand Sox fans had gone out to see it. And they stayed for a couple of hours after the game. And they were chanting, you know, thank you, Theo, back when Theo was the man around here. Then we began hearing, wicked piss off, wicked piss off. <laughs> and the St. Louis people were saying, what does that mean? <laughs> I said, it means fantastic, it means it was good. So 
one of the challenges about doing the book was finding things that weren't fantastic moments that people would remember. And I think one of the great things about this is there's just so much zany stuff happening in this park. Uh, I mean, everyone talks about the time that the St. Louis Browns sent a midget to the plate. Well, there was a midget played third for the Indians. I mean, he was a Red Sox fan, but the, in, this is when Ted Williams was such an incredible hitter, everything going to right field, that they did a William Shift. They moved everybody over to this side. They've been daring him to hit. The third base was open. There was no one there. A midget jumped out of the stands, picked up a glove, was playing the position. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the kinds of goofy moments that you end up writing about. One of the, the challenges is, over 100 years, to find all this stuff. And through the miracles of technology, what has been great is all our stuff is now digitized. All the clips that go all the way back. Up until recently, Everything up until 1979 was microfilm or clips. You had to go down and thumb through it. You would have gone blind. I mean, literally, a needle in a haystack, searching every page of everything every year to try to find the one thing you needed or or, or, uh, or not. So to be able to have it digitized now, I could go in with a search engine. Say, I want any time the word Ruth, say Ruth, and somebody else was mentioned in this this range page. What's great about the way they have it, the whole page comes up now. So you can see how it was laid out, the headlines, the photos, and that's what made the job a lot easier, was it, you know, you had a pretty good idea what you were looking for, uh, and, and you would be able to get it. The bigger challenge for the photo people uh, was that many of the photos used to be kept in what we call the morgue, which is down in the basement and all the photos are there. But anybody can walk in the morgue, and the morgue was open around the clock. Because back in the day, we had a nap in the paper, too. So people would be writing at 2, 3 in the morning sometimes. So what happened is, any great photo would get stolen. <laughs> so when you say, I'm going to bring this home for my son, for my nephew, or for my buddy, so I defy you to find a Bobby Orr photo. <laughs> Do we have anything interesting down there? But still, enough of that lasted. So we have a lot of that stuff in the book, and certainly anything more recent is great color. So the big challenge was in narrowing down stuff that would actually fit and at the same time, everything else that happened in the ballpark, it wasn't just baseball. I mean, this was our outdoor gathering place. After the common, this is where people went. Uh, and you can date yourself by what you remember happening there. Uh, I'll ask people, remember the mayor's charity field day? They said, what? I said, yeah, the mayor had a charity field day every year in the 50s and 60s, and they brought in groups. Again, I'm dating myself. I heard Stanky and our gang play there, and Petty and the Pandas. But they would bring those in. Football team, all three of the pro football teams in Boston played here, including the Patriots. So we used to go, um, it was, the gridiron was laid out side, side to side, so from third base to right field. You could sit in the bullpen, or just behind the bullpen, and when Gino Capaletti, who was the kicker, kicked an extra point, you could catch the ball in the bleachers. More recently, the Bruins played there against the Flyers. College hockey was there, a ton of soccer was there. Plus, a lot of political meetings. Well, Franklin Roosevelt gave the last speech of his life, his last campaign speech, at Fenway. And I think Frank uh, Sinatra sang the, the uh, anthem. Uh, Eamon de Valera gave a rally for the Irish Free State. There was lacrosse there. Uh, they have had a number of, uh, uh, of uh, US, um, uh, U.S. ceremonies for new citizens. I figure. Here's your welcome to America. <laughs> Let's go in this place of pain. <laughs> Let's go in this place where terrible things have happened. But what's remarkable about it is they now give tours of Fenway year-round. People pay. Pay to sit in an empty, freezing ballpark <laughs> just to be part of this thing. But I think one of the things that we have noticed is um, the Burr of Fenway, it's all ages, uh, it's all races, it's men and women. Uh, it's, it's amazing how many women love that ballpark, go to games all the time. Even if they're not huge baseball fans, they love going there. And it's almost, if you're a Boston student, even if you're not from here, a lot of people end up becoming baseball fans, uh, part of Red Sox Nation, because they were here for this. When my wife was a freshman here, uh, she was 1967. That was the Jim Lundborg year. So I, I told her, I said, you know what, it's not always like this. They're always going to manage. <laughs> well, let me tell you this, but I think there is this lore that keeps things going, and plus it is a New England team. 
not just Boston. If you go up to Maine, and always have always had radio stations up there, if you're on vacation any place in New England, you are with the Red Sox. And I think that's been one of the things. We don't have to share a team. Now, in the old days, we did. And one of the interesting stories about Northeastern, as you may know, is that at one point, the Red Sox and the Braves were both here. Uh, the Red Sox played, I think, uh, where Cabot, mm -hmm. Churchill, Hayden, mm -hmm. right around there, at the old Huntington Avenue grounds. And the Braves played at the South End grounds, literally across the, 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 in the tracks here. And these were old wooden ballparks. And the problem about ballparks then, they burned down. Uh, you had basically, it was tinder. The, the ballparks was, was the, the stands would bake in the sun, and someone would just toss a cigar away, or you know, something would be welling something, and it would just go up. So Fenway was one of the first concrete and steel ballparks. And the interesting thing is, is that you'll hear now, well, it's shaped that way because you had to cram it in. But there was nothing else out there. One of, this was a real estate player, basically. John Taylor and some of his friends owned land out there. And what better way to get it developed than to put a ballpark out there, which then meant that the, uh, the trolley lines would have to get moved out there, and they might be able to sell some of that. So what happened is literally, they built that thing in seven months, from, from groundbreaking to the finish. I mean, it's, it's less than it took us to write this book. <laughs> they built this thing. And they actually used part of the old Huntington Avenue grounds. They, they took some of the sod and took it in, um, in, in, in carts across that way. And of course, you know, Fenway's not that far from here. Uh, and but even then, the first year, they only, quote unquote, now drew 500,000 people from the whole first year. A couple of reasons. A, there wasn't a second ball for, for park here. But as the paper said, people need to get used to going in the new direction. They'd always come over here. What was interesting about Fenway is um, it only seated about 24,000 uh, in the beginning, and only about 11, 12,000 were what you would consider permanent. A lot were bleachers or special pavilions out this way. And back then, they did have a wall. It wasn't the monster. It was a fence big enough to sit on, on top. Uh, and the reason was to keep freeloaders from looking from the street. They wanted to make sure that people had to pay their way in. Because back then, you had very, you had smaller ballparks in terms of what they seated, sometimes at six or 8,000 in some cases. But the outfield was huge. I mean, you, you had, in some cases, 600 feet to dead center field. Uh, but you know, no one was ever gonna hit a ball out there. I mean, people never thought you would hit a home run over the wall over in Fenway. Because this was the day of what they called the, the, the dead ball era, where the ball was hit, we talked about like hitting a cabbage. They would use the same ball for 100, 110 pitches. I mean, some, now the ball, what, four or five pitches, maybe? It would get misshapen, it would get lumpy. Uh, in 1912, when the ballpark was open, the two guys that led the American League with 10 home runs apiece, home run Baker, and he had 10 home runs, and <laughs> that made a big, big move, and Tris Peak with the Red Sox. It was what they called small ball. It was bunts, it was stolen bases, uh, it was running around the, I mean, the wall, I mean, Red Sox now, if they get a triple, that's a huge thing. They get triple all the time back then. Because basically getting, hitting that ball so far, it would go over something, was very difficult. It took five games for the first ball to go over the wall at Fenway. Hugh Bradley did it, and the fans went crazy. They went nuts. He never hit another home run. But the feeling seemed to be, he went out of this place? So when Grace Field opened up, Ty Cobb, who was a great hitter, said, no one will ever hit a ball out of here. What was funny about it was when the uh, Braves won, the Miracle Braves are called, the 1914 came from dead last in the middle of July to win the pennant going away. Their ballpark, the South End, was so small, they borrowed Fenway. So they won the World Series in Fenway. Now the next year, they were building the new place, Braves Field, up at Villas, which, 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 as a matter of fact, a little part of that, the entranceway, is still there. That was big enough that the Red Sox, when they won the World Series in 15 and 16, won it at Braves Field. So the, again, these wonderful moments didn't happen there. <laughs> because Braves Field was about 40,000. Uh, so that was the way it was then. Uh, the other thing, too, you played afternoon baseball, clearly. I mean, there weren't night games for years. But I don't mean 1 o'clock games. I mean 3 o'clock games, 3.30 games. When the Red Sox played the Yankees on April 20th here, they're going to start at the same time that they did back then. And very often, you didn't home for dinner. There was a game, a famous 26-inning game in the majors that was done, it, it, it was called for dark, and said it began at 3 o'clock. 
These games will run two hours, in many cases, and not much longer. And that's why standing room, there, there was a lot of standing room. If you look at some of the photos in the book, you will see in the outfield ropes and people standing behind the ropes, or even standing behind the fielders. And a ball hit in there is not a home run, a ground rule double. So when the Red Sox won their first game, they hit three balls in there that might have been better had they been able to bang on something. So you had a really good seat for, for standing. But you could stand for two hours. You know, you, I mean, now, you know, who would stand for four, four hours? It was a very cheap seat. And it was actually a better seat than it would be up in the grandstand. We were a little more distant. So you could literally yell things to the players. And the players, you remember, left their gloves out there. So there was always a glove lying there. And of course, at Fenway, they had what was called Duffy Squibb. Duffy Lewis was the outfielder. He had to run up to catch the ball. It was an incline. It wasn't an accident. In, in a lot of ballparks then, they built an incline so people sitting on it could see. You go to a lot of college stadium now, they will have like a kind of like grass seating. It's on an incline. Same there. So when they finally rebuilt the ballpark, they didn't have Duffy Squibb anymore. But it was just such a different age. I mean, and looking at photos now, you look at, oh, at, at, at opening day, everyone is wearing a hat. It might be a derby, it might be a, a, a scally hat, they're wearing a hat. They're wearing overcoats, a lot of guys in college and ties. It was an event. I mean, no one was wearing a Duffy Lewis game jersey. <laughs> I mean, you know. And again, this was not unusual to hear. You, if you went many other places, it was the same. It was also true back, way back then, that the, everything was by train, and was really up until 1960-61. But St. Louis was the end of the world. There were no franchises west or south of that. And in 1912, the Red Sox spent a whole month on the road, a whole month. They got on a train and they didn't get off. And they played, I think, six of the seven other teams in that trip. So when you were home, you were home a long time. And when you were gone, you were gone a long time. But again, in m many of these cities, of, of the 16 teams, I think, belonged to 10 cities. Uh, Boston had two, St. Louis had two, Chicago had two, Philly had two, New York had three. Uh, I mean, so, so basically, there was always someone playing in this town. And early on, uh, the you know, kind of people went back and forth between the Red Sox and the Braves. The Red Sox did become the more dominant team. Uh, what was interesting, though, they didn't always sell out. I remember going there in the 60s, and there'd be two, three, four thousand people. In one, in one case, 465 people went to a Red Sox game. And it was also very telling, the most famous essay written about Fenway was uh, John Updike. Okay? Wasn't planning on being there, wasn't a sports writer, wasn't in the press box, didn't talk to anybody. And that is the one everybody remembers. Right? Cub fans bid kid a do. It was Ted Williams' last game. And his story was he went up to Beacon Hill to, you know, uh, he was looking for a woman up there that, who he knew. She wasn't home. And he said, ah, we'll get it that way. Walks in, buy a ticket, which you could do. You could walk in and buy a ticket almost to any game, even to the Yankees. Uh, you know, I mean, the idea of that place being sold out, it didn't happen in my whole childhood. The first time I remember a game being sold out was during the 1967 literally walk in and spend most of that. I, I remember spending eight hours one one Sunday there. It was a doubleheader, both went extra innings, and got in trouble for going home with my brother. So we've been, we're, we're family. No, 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 really. You know, they, they play 13 innings in the other game, but you could, you could spend a whole day for 50 cents. Uh, and I think what, what was nice about this was everybody got to go. Now you have to pay scalpers prices or buy them well in advance. The idea that you would have to go down in December, which you would have had to do, and line up for Yankees tickets then was, was, was just unheard of. So the, as uh, my old colleague, Mr. Marty Nolan, used to say, the ballpark is the sauce. When the teams weren't good, people would still come to the ballpark. And I think uh, what we didn't realize, we always thought this is what ballparks look like. If you didn't travel outside, you didn't realize that this place is unusual. The only park I've been even close is Wrigley Field. I had that same kind of feeling going in. Now, Yankee Stadium, the old one, was just majestic. I mean, that was, wow, look at this place. But Fenway, there was a real intimacy to it. Probably a little more intimate than maybe you wanted. Uh, easy to get hit by a ball ball. Easy to get hit by a thrown bat. Uh, and again, if you got up to go to the bathroom in the grandstands, everybody in your row still has to get up. Right? You have to apologize. <laughs> sorry, 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 once again. 
and you buy a hot dog, 15 people have their fingerprints on that hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I do think that it's kept that way just so people could conduct, you know? Why should we be comfortable when, when a great-grandfather wasn't comfortable? So we, we have to be and also, what kind of a place builds or renovates a stadium and keeps the manual scoreboard there? Protection. We do. But again, this is a town. We keep the old state house and the new state house, old city hall and the new city hall, old Hancock building and the new Hancock building. Now, one reason why we keep the old Hancock building is it's a weather forecast. Did you, did you all know that? Yeah. Now, flashing red is snow, right? What's flashing red in July? Rain out. Very good. <laughs> Socks rained out. And the good thing is it used to be able, before you had the time period, to, that was the biggest building here. You could see anywhere in Boston that the socks were being rained out. You, you didn't see it from the top of the line. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <Not blubbering. laughs> so those so we just don't throw things out. But what was amazing about the the uh, the manual scoreboard and still is, there's some suspense to it. And it used to be, well, I mean, well, even now, you have the number of the pitcher for every every team in the American League next to the team. And in the score uh, in the in the program it has a key. You know, number 41 for the Yankees is so and so. So you're watching the Yankees, which we always did. And suddenly, they would pull down the number of the Yankee pitchers. Uh oh, 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 this is good, this is good. And about 10 minutes later, they would pull down the number of the opposing team of the Yankees. That means they scored, they have to have scored. And now I'm thinking, all right, what number's going to come now? And they might put like a five or a six or a seven, and people will go nuts. So it always spooked visiting outfielders here. There'd be, be nothing going on. It'd be, Enormous roar. <laughs> <laughs> Someone just scored. And Jim Lodborg said that it was fun for, for, for all the players, too. If you were scoreboard watching in the final week, and you kind of look out and, and, and you would see. But that was the thing. If they ever built a new Fenway or even a renovated that didn't have that, Bostonians would be up in arms. Because it would be part of what you remember. As long as they have that, you say, okay, now I know this is still the same. Like, the Celtics played on that dead parquet floor, right? So when they built the new place, it still kept pieces of that thing. So you would, you know, you would at least know that that's what this is what we we, we recognize. As long as that there's that goofy parquet floor or some part of it, then we know. And I think Fenway, once you walk in, you say, okay, I see the wall that's still there, and we still see the manual. So whatever else they, they end up doing in this place, it's still going to be the same. And I think one of the, the great things about it now is you look back, you say, you know what, this could go, I don't know, um, maybe not number 100, but you know what, in my lifetime, this place may still be around. So I think one of the things that has been fun uh, about doing the book was going back in time and seeing how, how much it really hasn't changed. They were the same type of uniform, right? Most of the other things really, you know, uh, really aren't that different. God knows the clubhouses aren't that different. I mean, you go into the visiting clubhouse, it is tiny. It is tiny. And the Red Sox isn't a whole lot bigger. When you're in there, especially after they have won something, and the whole world is in there, and you're just getting sprayed with champagne, and you, you just can't move. I mean, Nomar Garchaparo, when he was here, literally had a red line around his cubicle. You couldn't step over it. <laughs> I mean, part, part of that was Nomar, you know, who was a bit obsessive. But... It also told there was so much of this. And you go to Yankee Stadium, it is huge. Their, I mean, their clubhouse is just massive. I mean, Fenway <coughs> is crammed in. But I think people kind of like that. And again, you know, Boston, we we feel suspicious if we're a bit too comfortable. And if the Red Sox weren't doing well in a place like that, you say, see, they're all country club guys now. We build them this wonderful new place, and look how they're playing, you know? They'd be even more angry than they are now. So, um, so I think that it's been fun. And, you know, people ask me what my greatest thrill was at Fenway. You know what? The first time I went in the clubhouse. It wasn't a game. I was going in the clubhouse for the glow. I'd just been there about six months. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Boston kid. I've been there forever. I've never been in the clubhouse. So I go in there and walk in and see the players and then walk down that, you know, narrow set of stairs through the tunnel and sit in the dugout. It's a great thing, you know? Now, my first experience was they wanted me to do something on Carl Young, who I didn't know. And I hadn't done any baseball before. So I didn't know that the, the 
Red Sox fans all had certain rituals and routines and times when you could talk to him and times when you couldn't talk to him. And what I didn't know about Yaz is when he was seat, when his chair was was turned around from his locker facing in, you couldn't talk to him. The time when you had most that you could talk to him, you couldn't talk to him. So I asked him something very innocuous and he barked at me. Oh. Plus, you know, I'm a boss. Oh my god, Yaz just barked at me. Oh my god, this is the worst thing in my life. <laughs> But it was as though I was getting into this inner sanctum. And one of the fun things about these ballpark tours, you get to see parts you wouldn't see during the regular season. And I think that's what we all want a real possession of this place in some way. You know, in the old days, if you were if you ran the bases, it meant you were drunk and, and they arrested you. Now you can the bases, <laughs> it's okay. You can throw a ball on your father's day with your, you know, with your dad. You can come in from any place in the world and see this place. So it really has. Uh, there used to be, you know, four or five places that everybody knew about. Fenway is still one of them, where uh, it has uh, a global reach. In Japan, they now know about the monster. They now know about Fenway. You know, they probably know about Puppy Bleeding Cup too. <laughs> Let me. I'm, we're keeping you guys a bit. But any any questions about this? Or other bit that we? Yes. Um, I was wondering when did the the monster really kind of become its own like character in the history? It's pretty good, but. You, the last 20, 20 years, maybe? Uh, we never called it that. We always called it the wall. Uh, and and what's funny is if you talk to non Bostonians, they think this thing is like the, the Great Wall of China. <laughs> and they come and say, you know, it's not that hard to hit one out here. It's only, thir it's only 37 feet high, and it's, it's in pretty close. You know, it, it, it's, an, it's not a long shot. In fact, Tom Yawkey used to want to hit balls. When the team wasn't in, he'd go down and have a bat boy throw him balls so he could try to hit them off the wall. But I think a lot of it has come in the last 10 to 20 years. Uh, and the idea that you could put monster seats up there, which by the way, I don't know if you've ever been up there, they're not great seats, because you can't see anything that happens under you. <laughs> so if they're a fantastic place and left you at you can't see them. But I think everybody now wants to come and sit in the monster seats once. But, but it was always the wall. Yes? Quick question about Fenway as a place and what it does to true baseball fans. Uh, back before WEI was ready to suck the life out of my soul and I stopped listening to it, they would go on at length about pink hats and that you couldn't get tickets to a Sox game because people were going to Fenway to go to Fenway and not to go to a ball game. What's your take on that? There is something true about that. Um, it's funny, if you go to Chicago, where both my sons worked after, after college, the, uh, what they'll tell you is the real Chicago guy is a White Sox fan. <coughs> that the Cubs fans are yuppies and people from out of town and they come for the ballpark. I do think there is something about that. Uh, I know the pink hat thing has been, uh, that's gone down hard with some of the old guys. Yeah, yeah, it's not a pink hat, I mean, of course, as you know, they, they don't like any uniform change at all, but there is something to be said to that, and they are marketing it. If you've been listening to recent talk radio, it's, oh yeah, it's all about the 100th year and now, it's all about Bobby V. It is, you know, they're going to have a lousy team when they know it, so they're going to sell the ballpark back to you, you know. But uh, I do think there's certainly more of that, and the more that it gets pushed, you know, I think, what, what do they call it? Uh, America's most most uh, uh, lovable ballpark? Beloved. Beloved. Beloved ballpark? Not by the guy that put it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Wadsworth said he came in, and he was in California, and he sees this lovely little brick house. He says, oh, isn't this nice? He sees the wall. He says, oh, my God, this is where I have to work? Get that behind me? <laughs> and that's why I think a lot of opposing players hate coming here. You know, you're up 9-5 in the ninth, and it's not enough. You know, you get this. Matter of fact, Joe Cronin, who played here, manager here, general manager, said it's a pissy ball club. You build a team to win here, you lose on the road. You win the lose on the road, win on the road, you lose here. Uh, and I think it has. Uh, I mean, this team has never been. Although it was called. Was it the Speed Boys, which is kind of a joke these days. Uh, but it's built for three-run homers. Big right-handed hitters that are going to go over the wall. Uh, and I think my first time watching a National League team, the 67 World Series, watched the final play. Lou Brock got on, and he went, and he stole a base. Oh, my God, they stole a base. The Sox <laughs> never stole a base. It was never done. So you do become a prisoner of the park. Remember, um, as a matter of fact, uh, Fred Lynn, who played center field here, and I almost knocked himself cuckoo running into the wall. That's why it's not padded. He said when Jim Rice played here, it was a 
great power by line drive hitter. The pitch ball was off the wall, and it sounded like a pachinko ball. Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> if you've ever seen a ball hit in the left field corner, it goes, bum, 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 just, just like that. So I think it's fun for us, but uh, guys who know, I mean, any left fielder who comes to play the Red Sox, Jim Rice would go out there for hours, just having guys pitch balls off the wall, so he could see how they'd come off, where to, yeah, how to field them.